to discover the muon neutrino. And they did something that we're still doing in many neutrino experiments today, which is produce a beam of neutrinos. And so the way you do this is you hit a, a target with a proton beam, and that produces uh, a bunch of pions and other particles, and those decay into muons and muon neutrinos. And you stop all the particles with some shielding, and then you then um, basically observe the remaining neutrinos in some detector. So they, their detector of choice was a spark chamber. And at the time, it wasn't really known whether um, the muon neutrino is different from an electron neutrino. So this was um, basically what they wanted to find out. And so their experiment basically, so this is Schwarz in front of the spark chamber, and you can see lots of uh, cosmic muon background events tra in, traversing the spark chamber. But here you can see the actual um, muon neutrino events that they observed. So you can see that there was nothing, nothing in the spark chamber. And then suddenly there was a track and again, nothing. And then a track again, nothing. And then the track, this is a clear signature of muon neutrinos. And um, what they found is that they observed 34 single muon event tracks uh, where they only expected five in, in those um, windows that they selected uh, from cosmic muon background. Um, and had the neutrino been, a muon neutrino been the same as an uh, muon electron, uh, sorry, as an electron neutrino, they would have also observed um, electron type events like these ones that they had from a test beam uh, where you can see a like, sort of much more shower-like behavior. Uh, but they didn't observe 29 such events or anywhere close to this. They only observed six events that had any kind of shower characteristic. And so basically this was proof that um, it was a new neutrino and that they had discovered the muon neutrino. So um, I've already sort of explained this a little bit, but just to say uh, what type of neutrino interactions we usually have. So usually what we have is a neutrino comes in, interacts with the matter via a charged boson, a W, and that produces one of those leptons that we observe, an electron, a muon, or a tau. And those charged turn events are quite uh, characteristic. So these are some nice event displays from the NOVA experiment. And you can see that an electron is visible as an electromagnetic shower. And then you have some activity from the matter that the neutrino interacted with. Uh, and a muon is observed as a long muon track. And again, some activity from, uh, from the matter. Um, but you also can have neutral current events. So where you have an interaction with a neutral um, boson, the Z boson. And then what you have is an elect uh, a neutrino coming in and coming out is also a neutrino. And you have some activity and this is the activity, but the neutrino that escapes is never seen. So these are the types of events that we usually look at in, in neutrinos. And so um, this leads me to talk about um, the tau neutrino, how this was discovered. So um, the final neutrino in the puzzle was actually observed by the donut experiment at Tremilab. And they basically built a beam of uh, tau neutrinos. A very similar type of beam of the protons was much bigger. And what they used as their detector was an emulsion target. So having very, very high spatial resolution. And so what they wanted to see there was Basically, when the tau neutrino interacts with some nucleus, it creates a tau and some activity. And the tau is very heavy and its lifetime is very short. And so it decays quickly. And the decays that we're interested in is basically where the tau decays um, leptonically, either into a, another tau neutrino, an electron and an uh, electron antineutrino, or a tau neutrino, a muon and a muon antineutrino. And so what happens is that the secondary decay creates a little kink in the track. And so what you see is here, for example, you have a neutrino event and basically you have the tau coming out and suddenly it decays and suddenly you have a muon track. And you, again here, tau coming out and then it decays and you have a muon track. And again here, so the donut a collaboration found four such events and this was basically proof that um, the tau neutrino existed and it was consistent with all the predictions. And so these are all the three neutrinos that we know about at the moment. Um, the last topic I will mention is neutrino mass and oscillations. 
So neutrinos, as I just, you know, we must already realize are very, very mysterious, but there is something that makes them even more mysterious. Um, so in the standard model, neutrinos originally were meant to be massless, but it was realized that they're not massless. Uh, in fact, what happens is they do have mass and they change from one neutrino type to another as they travel. So you can have a muon neutrino beam and as it travels through space, it will change into um, tau neutrinos, electron neutrinos, some will stay as muon neutrinos. So this is what we call neutrino oscillations because it, they change back and forth. And um, this is because neutrinos are actually, the neutrinos we see, the muon, electron neutrino, tau neutrino, are not actually just that. They are actually sort of combinations of three different neutrino mass states. And those combinations are different for each neutrino type. So when we observe the neutrinos, we see those electron, muon, and tau neutrinos, but actually they're made out of those mass states. And so this is governed by this, you know, in particle physics, PMNS mixing matrix that mixes those mass states to get those flavor states that we see. And what this allows us to do is in our experiments by measuring all those things, we can actually access those invisible masses and determine what the difference is between those masses even though we cannot actually directly see those. So um, I hope this uh, sort of gave you a flavor about um, the history of neutrinos. And you can see that there's a lot of exciting things to discover. It's a very interesting area of physics uh, today. And we have to build giant detectors to see neutrinos and measure their properties. And Costas and Ivana will continue the story and tell you more uh, about all the new experiments that are being done. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anna. That was absolutely fascinating to hear how, how we discovered these tiny little mysterious, uh, mysterious particles and how only a few events were, were a discovery. Um, that's absolutely amazing. If anybody does have any questions, please do feel free to pop them in the comments, in the chats. Um, however, uh, whichever platform you're watching, uh, watching with us, then do pop them in. in the, while we're just waiting to see if people have any questions, I do have one question for you, Anna. Um, what, when neutrinos were first sort of postulated, when they said, actually, maybe it's this new particle, how much, uh, how much resistance was there to an idea? Did everybody say, oh yeah, that makes sense? Or was everyone like, don't be ridiculous? Um, I think, I think it's it crazy. <laughs> um, you know, I wasn't privy to those discussions, but I imagine that, you know, given that some people were very leading physicists were suggesting that, you know, the conservation of, uh, you know, energy might not be tr always true. I think it must have been probably quite a relief for somebody su to suggest something that is actually reasonable, <laughs> even though I know that there was some resistance, you know, to this idea as well. But yeah, <laughs> you know, there was at least something to hunt for, right? <laughs> Absolutely, definitely much, much more sensible than the no, not conservation <laughs> of energy, that just scares me. Thank <laughs> you so much, uh, Anna. Do pop questions uh, into your chat functions, however you're watching, uh, and we can ask them to uh, Anna at the end as well. Um, but for now, um, I am going to hand over to uh, Costas, who is going to tell us a little bit more about how neutrino experiments developed and how we got to where we are today. Costas, are you okay? Are you here? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Just a moment to share my screen. Okay. Uh, can you see that? Looks great. Thank you. Um, right. If you press play, then we should see it on full screen. Great. Oh, All right. sorry, Costas. We've gone into uh, presentation mode, so we can see your next slide um, as well. I'm not sure if you shared the wrong screen, perhaps. Second, yeah, you have multiple screens, yeah. Yes, it's always tricky. Won't be a minute, everyone. Um, we may be able to find, hunt for tiny, mysterious particles, but we have the same problems with Windows and Macs as everybody else. Is that, uh, okay? that looks perfect, Costas. Yes, thank you. Over to you. All right. Um, okay, so my name is uh, Kostas Andreopoulos. I'm a professor at the University of Liverpool, 
and also a scientist uh, at Rutherford Upton Laboratory. And I have been working in uh, neutrino physics for uh, 25 years. So I'm very happy today to be able to recount some of the key moments in what was really an amazing journey uh, that went through the uncovering and then the resolution of the so-called uh, uh, solar neutrino problem and atmospheric neutrino anomaly, uh, and led to the discovery of uh, oscillations uh, that were first proposed by Bruno Potenkovo in 1957. So the study of oscillations over the previous 40, 50 years really took uh, center stage uh, and it will be continued to, to be the case for, for many more decades, uh, as uh, you shall see. Okay, so first uh, things first, uh, what are oscillations? Um, Anna talked a little bit about this. It, it's a quantum mechanical phenomenon. And in this brief talk, uh, I don't really want to go into details and you know, so lots of equations, but I, do, I don't really have to because you can actually quite easily understand uh, what is its effect. And it is this effect that will be important. Uh, this is a phenomenon that requires that neutrinos have non-zero mass. Remember, as Anna explained in the standard model originally, neutrinos were massless. And actually, this is the mechanism through which we understood that they have some tiny but non-zero mass. Okay, um, so uh, basically, as a neutrino gets produced through some mechanism, the details here don't matter, uh, and then travels uh, to the point where it will be detected. Again, details don't matter. There is some distance through which neutrino has to travel, and it is at that point where oscillations kick in. And the effect is that a neutrino that started its life in a particular flavor state, for example, let's say mu neutrino in this, in this case here, can be detected as a different state, for example, as electron neutrino. Uh, the probability for this uh, transition uh, from one flavor to another depends on the flight path or the baseline as we call it, and the energy of a neutrino, or you know, more correctly, depends on the ratio of the two, L over E, and it is something that you can control experimentally. It also depends on several other physics parameters that a priori are unknown, and it is our task as experimentalists to try and measure those. Okay, uh, so that's what oscillations are. Um, so if I had an experiment and I was starting at, uh, you know, some initial time uh, with some beam that was uh, made out of uh, just new neutrinos. Uh, then uh, after a while, uh, as neutrinos propagate, so basically as the ratio of L over E changes, I will expect to see changes in the composition of that beam. And you can see here, I have drawn for some set of parameters that don't matter here, the probability of finding every species within that beam. Um, okay, uh, you see that if I was measuring things at that initial point here, uh, I would see only new neutrinos, whereas if I measure a bit later, every single neutrino in my beam, I would get a different composition. It would be mostly new tau's with just a smaller proportion of new e's and new mu's. Uh, notice that this probability has this oscillatory behavior, and, and really that's uh, the smoking gun signature of oscillations, okay? And uh, in, in the words of Duke Ellington, if you are looking for oscillations, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing, okay? This characteristic uh, oscillatory behavior is the smoking gun of this effect and allows us to discriminate this from other effects that you know, might make continuous disappear and so on. Okay. So there are many ways we can do these measurements. Once we usually we start with a, a beam that is pure, contains uh, neutrinos of just one flavor, and we either study how that flavor disappears, these are the disappearance studies, or we may study how uh, other flavors may, ap may ap appear within that beam, and that's the, the appearance studies, okay? Okay, um, so there were two problems that the resolution of which led us to the discovery of, uh, of oscillations, okay? 
Uh, so let me first discuss the so-called solar neutrino problem. So how does the sun shine? It was one of the most important questions that concerned scientists early in the previous century. Okay? So I think sometime in the 30s, it was that the main process was understood uh, through the fusion of four protons for the creation of a helium atom, we get some small amount of energy, 27 MeV, and uh, abundant neutrinos. Uh, the solar neutrino flux uh, in our location on Earth deduced from the solar luminosity, that's the amount of solar energy that we receive on the Earth, is estimated to be around 60 billion per second per square centimeter. Okay. Uh, in fact, these neutrinos are gener generated through many, many distinct processes that uh, I have highlighted here. For a star that has the mass of our sun, the so-called PP chain is by far uh, the most dominant chain of reactions. And there are neutrinos uh, that emanate from different reactions. And usually they get the name of that reaction. So we have the PP, PP, beryllium, and boron neutrinos. And you can see that they have different spectrum. Uh, the PP neutrinos are by far the most abundant. Uh, you notice that this plot here is in log scale and they are the lower energy ones. Whereas the boron and the uh, beryllium neutrinos, which are higher energy ones, uh, are relatively more rare. Okay. And now here is an interesting idea that uh, got uh, the, the interest, of, interest of scientists in the late 60s. Can we confirm our mechanism for the sun for, for energy production in the sun by detecting those neutrinos? Okay, and that was exactly what uh, uh, Raymond Davis uh, set out to do. Uh, he used uh, this big tank, which is shown there. Actually, Ray Davis is also pictured here. This is at Home Stake Mine in, in South Dakota. He filled that huge tank with uh, tetrafluoroethylene, which is basically uh, a cleaning fluid. And the idea was that these neutrinos will interact with uh, chlorine and will produce argon. The energy threshold for that process is relatively high, it's just you know, 0.8 MeV. And that meant that his experiment was basically blind to the most abundant neutrinos, the PP ones, that are shown with that red frame there, but he could still glimpse the higher energy boron and beryllium ones. That's not a real time experiment. He could not understand what was going on, you know, at any given moment, but once a month, he had to purge that entire volume of 600 tons of, you know, tetra tetrafluoroethylene uh, and through a complex chemical procedure, extract and count through the radioactive decays, just a handful uh, of uh, argon atoms. Okay, thinking about this still blows my mind, and that was a spectacular experiment. He did succeed to observe solar neutrinos, and for that reason, uh, Ray Davis was awarded with the 2002 uh, Nobel Prize in Physics right, for pioneering contributions and the detection of cosmic neutrinos. Uh, however, there was one problem. Okay? Uh, every time, month after month, as he was extracting, you know, argon atoms uh, from his tank and was measuring how many he found inside there, and from that, deducing the flux of solar neutrinos, he was finding a value. I don't know if you can see my mouse here. Uh, was finding a, a, a value of around, uh, you know, 2.5 solar neutrino units that corresponds to 10 to minus 36 interactions per atom uh, and per second. To understand what this means, the corresponding rate was about one argon atom every two days. So every month that he was measuring, he was just finding there, you know, 15 atoms. Okay. And that was way smaller than the prediction of the standard solar model that was predicting something around, around eight solar neutrino units. So he was measuring about 30% of the predicted value. Uh, and that persisted again, 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 
uh, throughout the years as he was doing this experiment very carefully and uh, understanding all sources of uh, systematic uncertainty. And this deficit became known as the solar eternal problem. Uh, did people believe that at that time? I mean, not really, sorry. Uh, people did believe that the measurement should be wrong because, okay, uh, how sure are we that you can process 600 tons of a cleaning fluid and just count and extract and count a handful of atoms. There must have been many he missed and he didn't know about. And in the end, the deficit was with respect to a theoretical prediction and how much can we trust that theoretical prediction? Remember the Holmesdake experiment was not looking at the most abundant PP flux of neutrinos that is well constrained from the solar luminosity. Uh, it was looking at this more rare high energy boron and beryllium neutrinos that had a dramatic dependence on the temperature of the solar core, 10 to the 10 or 20 to the 24. If you make a small mistake in your estimation of the temperature of the sun, that will cascade to an enormous error in the estimate of these fluxes. Uh, so it, it had to be wrong. But over the next 30 years, physicists kept refining and validating both their experimental methods, but also the theory. And that has to be really one of the greatest scientific stories of the, the 20th century. Uh, there, there were a series of advances that you know, I cannot really uh, discuss here in detail, uh, using helio helioseismology and building in input and constraints into the flux predictions, uh, constructing new low threshold radiochemical experiments using gallium so that one can probe the more well constrained PP neutrino flux of, from the sun, uh, demonstrating the validity of these experiments using very intense radio man made, man -made uh, radio, uh, radioactive sources, which are the strongest ever made and could eclipse the sun in neutrinos, and also constructing new types of real time experiments that had different systematics and so on. But this was a problem that really was not going away. Okay. Uh, so at that time, uh, I think it was a time to, to contemplate uh, that actually something might be wrong with, with neutrinos. Because uh, you, you, what you see here in this plot is predictions of the standard solar model for the chlorine experiment, for the water experiments, the real time ones, super Kamiokande and Kamiokande, and here the SAGE and the Galax experiment using gallium. Okay, the prediction is the tall column. And with blue, you see the measurement. In all the cases, we saw a deficit, and actually a different deficit in every experiment which had different thresholds and so different solar neutrinos, which suggested that whatever was happening had a dependency on the neutrino energy. Okay. There were many different hypotheses that could explain what was wrong with our neutrinos and all of them could fit the data. Okay. So which one was correct, oscillations or something else? And it really took a new and very ingenious experiment to, to understand uh, what was going on. Uh, and that experiment was the, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory in, in Canada. Uh, the snow detector uh, was basically consisted of a, a very large acrylic vessel that was containing a thousand tons of heavy water, deuterium-2 oxygen, and it was surrounded by about 10,000 photosensitive devices. Okay. So particles and interactions within the, that detector were identified by the detailed pattern of light that was detecting in these surrounding uh, PMPs. And you can see an example of them there with the pattern of light illustrated here with the colors. What was really novel about snow is that it could de detect neutrinos, solar neutrinos in multiple ways. There was this charged current scattering of deuterium so a neutrino interacts with deuterium, producing an electron and two protons. And that process was sensitive only to electron neutrinos. Okay. But it was also possible to measure neutrinos through neutral current scattering. So a neutrino scatters of deuterium and produces a proton and a neutron. And this process is sensitive to all flavors. 
So it could, it could make complementary measurements, measure just electron neutrinos and then all neutrinos. Measuring just electron neutrinos, as the previous experiments did, Snow saw indeed the expected deficit. But then measuring the total flux of neutrinos, Nui, the new mu, the new tau combined, it saw that this flux was actually consistent with the standard model expectation for electron neutrinos. And that was it, really convincing evidence that some of the electron neutrinos, you know, that's some of the particles that started their life as electron neutrinos in the sun arrived here as something else, new or tau neutrinos. Okay, so that was a direct evidence for oscillations. And for that reason, Arthur MacDonald in uh, 2015 was awarded again the, the Nobel Prize of Physics. Okay, uh, but that was not really enough uh, because it's one thing measuring what rains down from the sky and quite another making a very controlled experiment on Earth with man-made neutrinos. Okay. Could we find an appropriate source of neutrinos? Well, that was what the Kamland experiment tried to, to achieve using electron antineutrinos that were produced by nuclear reactors, which as Anna explained, they are prolific sources of neutrinos. Okay. And back at that time, uh, 15, 20 years ago, about 20% of the world's nuclear power was produced in Japan and about 80% of that at a distance between 140 and 200 kilometers from the Kamioka mine in, in Japan, which was just the right distance for the typical energy of reactor neutrinos uh, to produce an oscillation effect. Okay. Uh, so the Kamioka detector was basically again a, a large balloon made of nylon that included um, some substance we call liquid scintillator and it was surrounded by about 2000 photosensitive devices okay, that could record the pattern of light produced by the particles that were uh, coming out of neutrino interactions. The detector detection method was the very same detection method that Anna described that was used by Rhinus and Cohen for the first discovery of neutrinos. Uh, the electron of the neutrinos from the reactors interact with protons and produce an electron, a positron that gives a prompt signal and also a neutron that travels around for a while and then gets captured and emits light. Uh, and it's that delayed coincidence between the two signals, which is you know, quite efficient in selecting these types of events and discriminating against all backgrounds. And indeed, Kamland managed not only to see very strong disappearance of electron antineutrinos from reactors as expected um, based on what we knew from snow, but by reconstructing the energy of these neutrinos and as, as a result reconstructing the flight path over the energy ratio, it managed to see this wiggly behavior of the uh, survival probability, which as I said at the beginning, is really the smoking gun of oscillations. Okay? So this dust line above is what you would expect if you had no oscillation, the data points is what was measured, and the blue line gives you the best fit estimate assuming oscillations are going on, which describes the data beautifully. Okay, now neutrino physics uh, is a field that historically has been developed through a series of uh, anomalies, uh, and it was led by experiment uh, and less by theory. And one such other anomaly that people were grappling at, at about the same time as the solar neutrino problem was the so called atmospheric neutrino anomaly. Okay. So neutrinos are abundantly create, created when a cosmic, ray, cosmic rays hit molecules on the atmosphere. Uh, these interactions produce mesons like pions, for example, and then neutrinos can be found in the decayed chains of these mesons. Because we understand how mesons decay, uh, uh, the ratio uh, of different neutrino species in the cosmic ray, in, in the atmospheric neutrino flux, is actually very well understood. So, for example, if you see here, 
the pion produces a new antenna here, and the neon then decays again, creates another new neutrino and the electron neutrino. So roughly speaking, the race of new neutrinos to electron neutrinos is about two, and that's actually quite well known. Uh, these neutrinos have very broad range of energies from 100 MeV up to 100 TeV, so much, much higher energy than the solar neutrinos I was talking before, and flight paths that can range from 10 kilometers if they come from just above your head, or up to 13,000 kilometers if they come through the Earth from below your feet. Okay. So in the 60s, there was a lot of motivation to investigate weak interactions at very high energies, and atmospheric neutrinos were actually a very suitable source that was coming for free. Okay. You didn't have to make them. Uh, so experiments were built uh, at the East Rand gold mine in South Africa and the Collar gold field mine in India. And simultaneously, almost in 1965, they managed to detect these neutrinos and confirm that our models of weak interactions at high energies you know, give more or less what you expected. The observed rate was somewhat lower than expected, but you know, people did notice it was within large uncertainties, so that was quickly forgotten. Till the 80s, when a grand unified theorist told us that the proton might be unstable. So big experiments, usually with water Cherenkovs, uh, you know, huge volumes of water instrumented with photomultipliers like IMB or Kamioka were built and to study proton decay. And in these experiments, interactions of atmospheric neutrinos is actually a background. They can mimic the new physics signal that you are looking after. So atmospheric neutrinos were studied in, in some detail, and then it was found that the measured ratio of their uh, of neon to electron neutrinos from the atmosphere was not consistent with a well understood and you know, trusted expectation. Uh, since then, this hypothesized signal of proton decay has not been observed yet, but actually new physics was lurking in that discrepancy between measurement and prediction for the background. Okay, the, this discrepancy became known as the, the, so, the atmospheric neutrino anomaly. At about that time, one of the experiments that was actually studying atmospheric neutrinos was the so-called Super Kamiokande experiment in, uh, uh, in Japan. That's you know, one of the most famous experiments of all time in, in neutrino physics. It's a huge tank of water that contains about 50,000 tons of you know, very, very pure and clean water. And it is surrounded by very, very large photosensitive devices that you can see here. Okay. I mean, they're, they're just 20 inches across there. They're just huge. This is a, a ginormous detector. Um, neons and electrons, which are produced respectively when new neutrinos and electron neutrinos interact, can be uh, identified through the exact pattern of light that they emit. Uh, when a particle, charged particle within water travels faster than the, the speed of light in water, it emits radiation called Cherenkov radiation at a characteristic angle that depends on the velocity of the particle. And you can see that uh, uh, because the neon is so much heavier and doesn't easily, uh, doesn't get knocked around by other atomic electrons, this pattern creates uh, a ring which is very crisp, has very well-defined edges, whereas the corresponding ring for the electrons is actually very, very fuzzy. Uh, so the, this experiment was actually very good at measuring and discriminating between electrons and neons, so between neon neutrinos and electron neutrinos, and also measuring their energy and direction. Okay, so I think I was uh, in the early days in my graduate school in 1998, when some day there was a rumor at the lab about a spectacular new discovery that was just announced at, at the conference. And that was the slide that was shown there by the Super Cameo Candidate collaboration. What they managed to do was actually measure the zenith angle dependence of electron and neutron interactions from the atmosphere. The zenith angle is the angle with respect to the, the vertical direction. Okay? 
So if you are looking on the uh, right hand side here, there are the upgoing neutrinos, the one that come from below your feet, and uh, the other side, uh, on the, uh, sorry, on the, on the right, so for cosine theta of one, equal to one, are the downgoing particles uh, that come from above. You could see here the measurement and the expectation. And for the case of electron neutrinos, uh, you see there is uh, within errors, you know, reasonable uh, agreement. But there is a stark disagreement here for mu neutrinos. And you can see a very strong deficit observed for muon neutrinos, which is though concentrated for neutrinos coming from below. If you look here, neutrinos coming from above, uh, the theory and the experiment really agree. But if you look at neutrinos coming from below, uh, you get about half of what you expect. And that was hypothesized was because the neutrinos that come from below your, your feet have to go through the earth and therefore have much longer time to oscillate. Okay. And for that discovery, uh, Takaki Kazita, again, together with Art MacDonald of Snow, who received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2015. Okay. But that, that was not enough. Can we confirm again that hypothesis with man made neutrinos? And that was the start of the era of the accelerator based uh, long baseline neutrino experiments, which are tre tremendously difficult experiments. To confirm the effect that was seen at Super Kamiokande with atmospheric neutrinos for the kind of energies that you can actually make in accelerators easily, uh, they suggested that the flight paths should be of the order of hundreds of kilometers. Okay. So you understand the obvious difficulty. We had to make neutrino beams strong enough to produce a substantial flux uh, hundreds of kilometers away, let alone being able to. to direct this beam at the detector, you know, sitting so, so far away. Uh, there, there was an experiment built in Japan going, constructing a, a beam that went from the KK lab to, to Kamioka. Uh, and then the Minos experiment uh, in US with a neutrino beam going from Fernland to the Sudan mine in uh, Northern Minnesota. Okay. Using multiple detectors, both at near and far sides, was a very effective way to mitigate very large uncertainties in our understanding of how neutrinos get produced and interact, which allowed us, despite these uncertainties, to make precision measurements. Okay, Minos was the unquestionable king of Costas. that first generation. Costas, I'm so sorry to interrupt, um, but we are running a little bit short of time. Um, um, and so if you could wrap up in the next minute or so. Then we can yes, have yes, a, that's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm near the end. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 Minos, so, so Minos did manage to, to make very detailed measurements. So to confirm this understanding of oscillations and measure precise measurement of the relevant parameters that allows us to characterize you know, the, these effects. So circa 2002, 2000, having resolved these anomalies, uh, the community embarked on a program to build new experiments both to identify some subdominant oscillation channels and to perform precision measurements. And there were numerous experiments, mostly of two types, short baseline reactor experiments using multiple detectors and long baseline accelerator experiments of a second generation, TPK and NOVA. They gave spectacular measurements that I don't have time to go through. And you know, in many ways, that was the triumph of the three active flavor uh, mixing paradigm. But there is one measurement I need to uh, describe before I, I finish, because that has really tremendous ramifications for the future. And that's indications for charge parity invariance. Uh, what caused the observed matter and matter asymmetry in the universe is actually one of the biggest mysteries in science today. We know that everything, or we, we believe that everything we see today is a result of one part in 10 to the 10 difference between primordial matter and antimatter. So something has to be different in the laws of physics about matter and antimatter. What is it? We don't know. And there are not many sources of CP violation in uh, the standard model. Uh, neutrino mixing is such a, a possible source, and we can look for it by looking for difference in the ways electron neutrinos appear 
in the immune interleukin and electron antineutrinos appear in the immune antineutrinobin. And recently, there were very strong indications for matter-antimatter asymmetry violation in neutrinos that were observed by the 2 experiment. And there was this paper here, now by now quite famous in, in nature, saying that the mirror has cracked because CP, P, the parity violation is kind of a mirror symmetry. All right, so the mirror has cracked, but it will take two new mega experiments, Dune and Hyper-K, to finish the job started decades ago. And oscillations will continue to, to take center stage uh, for, for many, many decades. And uh, Ivana will discuss these mind-blowing mega experiments in, in, her, in her next talk. OK, so that's it. And sorry for being a bit late. Thank you, Costas. It was wonderful to hear um, all about uh, all about that. And we can clearly see how, how much you love all of the neutrinos. There have been some great questions um, in the chat. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand straight over to Ivana. And then maybe, Costas, if you could pop some, uh, write some answers in the chat, then I'm sure the wonderful team at SURF will be able to, um, to share those out as text yeah, absolutely. questions. Do keep the questions um, coming, everybody. All right, I'm going to hand straight over to Ivana to finish us up uh, and give us a quick look about what the future holds for neutrinos uh, and neutrino physics. Ivana's having a few issues with her internet, so she might uh, she might turn her camera off at one point, at some point, if it uh, to to keep the flow uh, going. Ivana, are you ready? Hello, Sophie. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, uh, I will turn my camera now. Uh, can you see me? Yep, looks great. Okay, so I will give you um, sorry. Okay, so I will give you a, a, a sneak peek to modern experiments. Uh, I'm a particle physicist at uh, uh, STFC in the UK. Before I worked on uh, LHC in uh, the Atlas experiment, which everyone, I guess, knows. And uh, I recently joined Dune working on the data acquisition system. And I wonder if everyone knows about uh, all the neutrino experiments like we do for LHC. Uh, I like surfing the internet and neutrino physics, of course, and I still uh, haven't solved the, um, what I don't like is overlapping events when many, so many things are ongoing. And I'm also interested with my hobbies also has to do with work. I'm interested in how humans and machines are interacting. So my the previous speakers did a great job to simplify um, the introduction uh, and uh, explain everything about neutrinos. So these historical events allowed us to ask really sensible questions about neutrinos and about fundamental physics. And both of them have implications to the rest of physics, to society, and thus they affect all of us. So. Uh, that's why it's so exciting to study neutrino physics, thanks to its connection to everything else. Um, to answer these questions, we can go two ways. One is to make a theory, and there are thousands of theories. But how do we know which one is correct and what, where is the truth? So we do this using the scientific method, which means performing experiments. We use state-of-the-art technology. Uh, to uh, solve engineering challenges. Uh, we need to do detector research and development, uh, improve the existing methods, and even invent new techniques. Because the neutrinos are so difficult to detect as unexplained, it really takes so many experiments, as shown here, such diversity and variety of techniques and not only be because of that, but they are abundant and there are so many sources of neutrinos. So this is a, 
uh, overview. Uh, and it's not even a complete picture. And there is an active research ongoing to improve our detection techniques. So how do we detect the neutrinos? How do we measure them? They are invisible. So we can only know there was a neutrino when it interacts with an electron, nucleon, or nucleus inside our detection medium and produce charged particles, which are then measurable. And this can be an electron. So this is a sketch of uh, our detector. It, contain, it is, contains detection medium surrounded by sensors and electronics, which produce signal. And that's how we can infer uh, information about the incoming neutrinos. There are several methods to detect the charge, the, ch uh, the produced charge uh, using electronics for charge collection or uh, the sharing of radiation, which is emitted by a charged particle traveling in a medium. Also, if the medium is a scintillator, it produces the specific light called scintillation light. And these are the three basic methods. And then to do more sophisticated um, analysis, we can combine them, um, two or three of them. And that's uh, what we are trying in the future. Uh, this is a, um, a more um, zoomed view of some of the biggest ongoing and planned experiments in the future, uh, which you might have heard about. Super Kamiokande is filled with water. And there are three big detectors like Nova, Juno, and uh, Snow Plus uh, filled with liquid scintillator. And then they, they're limited in size, although they are huge. But if we want to go to even larger detection sizes, uh, we use the ice on the South Pole in Ice Cube and uh, Mediterranean water uh, in the KM3 net experiment in the future. Uh, the, this is now zooming in even into the two biggest experiments, into the uh, neutrino experiments in the future, Hyperkamiokande in Japan and Dune at CERF in the US. Uh, the characteristic of both are that they're located deep underground. They are huge in volume. This is the largest vessels we can build at the moment. Uh, they, they're envisaged to operate over 20 years and um, okay, and uh, uh, they they um, um, operated by international collaboration in partnership with industry. Uh, this is the Dune collaboration, which I'm a member of, and it consists of more than thousand uh, three hundred members from two hundred institutions, and they are from. 33 countries so far, and it really takes that amount of effort to build such a detector. Um, this is to illustrate the interest um, in neutrino physics at the last neutrino uh, conference where more than 3000 people participated in such a virtual space. And we hope that in the future, this can uh, um, be combined with in-person meetings and other uh, social events. Uh, now the outline, I will quickly go through two, uh, three questions that um, are interesting. Are the, do the protons decay? This is cr uh, scary. Uh, can we use neutrinos as messengers? That's a very, very clever idea. And uh, is the matter antimatter symmetry uh, uh, also due to uh, the due to the neutrinos do they contribute to that so the first is the proton decay uh, in general the protons uh, are what all the matter the stuff that we call uh, is made of and if they decay uh, that we yeah our world will change and uh, how they can decay. Uh, the, the decays and interaction in physics are governed by symmetries and conservation laws. So 
if there is a theory which uh, violates those laws, then the proton can break. And there are indeed such theories which um, are co called, for example, the grand unified theory, which unifies the three existing forces. And they predict that the proton will decay after 10 to the 35 years, for example, around that range. Uh, we, we, have, we can measure those decays by the techniques that I just described, and, and they were also described by Anna, by detecting the, um, the charged particles in our huge detectors. And experiments have found that the, the proton lives more than 10 to the 34 years. And this has helped to rule out some ideas because none, a decay, not, none of those decays was seen. Um, here's a plot of the different theories. And here I show that it really takes of the order of 20 years of running to reach the next uh, limit, which is one order of magnitude high, 10 to the 35. Then supernova neutrinos, these are they are produced in abundance and carry 99% of the energy when a, a supermassive star collapses. So th they should be very useful, but it's very also very difficult to detect them. And we have just detected from one source in 1987 to convince ourselves enough that this is very useful information. So in the future, we uh, currently super Kamelkande uh, is detecting super, uh, trying to detect supernova neutrinos. And in the future, Dune will be much more sensitive as well. And uh, here the characteristic is that we have thousands of events coming from such a supernova burst compared to 10 events from normal operation. So this is a very um, distinct signature, but it's also very rare. Uh, we, since uh, this is difficult to detect, we also try to find neutrinos coming from um, um, uh, shortly after the Big Bang, and those are um, abundant but very low energy. So that's another challenge while they are very difficult to detect. And so far, none has been detected, and it will be a breakthrough if we find these uh, neutrinos. Uh, then I briefly uh, then I come to the violation of CP um, of the CP uh, symmetry, which cost us uh, hinted to. Um, this uh, uh, is described by so-called parameter CP violating phase, and it's uh, fortunate that uh, the neutrino oscillations are sensitive to this parameter. So the neutrino, um, muon neutrinos, which are coming from an accelerator after traveling some distance will oscillate to electron neutrinos. And we can measure this, uh, um, this uh, violating phase, which is in the range from zero to 180. And uh, this is a summary of the results which we have. Uh, there is two regions where, where uh, CP is not violated. Uh, at 90 degrees or pi over two, we have um, dominance of antimatter over matter. And at minus pi over two uh, is, uh, will indicate that matter dominates over matter. And that is the state that we see at the moment. And the result at the experiment is pointing exactly at the result where we, which we expect. And um, you see that uh, there is still a very large range to cover, and that's why uh, more uh, statistics is required. Here, this measurement is done on the basis of uh, not, not so many events. You see here, the, it's of the order of 20 and 6 for the antineutrinos. Uh, this technique relies on our uh, measurement of the electron and the muon neutrinos. And thanks to our powerful detectors, we, we can really uh, distinguish 
those characteristic features. This is called the Cherenkov a radiation ring inside Super Camille Kande. And the electron neutrinos give a mass, much fuzzier ring than the muon-like neutrinos. And the same is true for the supernova detector, which is um, using tracking colorimeters, so a very different technique. But we see a cl clear difference between the two types of neutrinos. And and the, and the final results are extracted usually by looking at such uh, plots. Uh, and uh, they are complicated and difficult to understand or, and interpret, and they require statistics methods to analyze. But that's what it takes to, uh, to find the result at the end. So the result is uh, for, for the CP violating parameter is um, at, one, at minus p over uh, two, minus p over two, for the uh, super Camille Kande experiment, but the Nova experiment gives uh, an incompatible uh, measurement, so they disagree at the moment, uh, and uh, that's why um, more measurements will be needed, and um, and another experiment like Dune will be required to solve this. Uh, discrepancy. And this is um, the outline of the, the timeline of super of Hippocamilcande and, and Dune. We are now here in the construction phase of both experiments. And by the middle or end of this decade, they both are expected to, uh, to start taking data. And for the CP violation parameter, we will uh, be able to, uh, with five with 99% confidence limit or so-called five sigma, uh, know whether the CP violating parameter is, uh, is close to the current value. So indeed, with these experiments, we are looking forward to definite answers to some of the most interesting questions. And yeah, stay tuned for more news coming soon and in the future. Fantastic, thank you so much, Ivana. I love your final, your final picture. It's like you're all James Bond trying to, <laughs> trying to find out the mysteries of the universe. Um, and it's really clear that there are so many uh, exciting things coming up in neutrino physics. Um, we just have another couple of minutes. Um, so I would like to ask uh, each of our panelists just one question, but um, because we are, Running a little bit over, I'm just going to uh, ask you to answer in one sentence or less, and it can't be a really long sentence either. Um, so uh, you've all shown us this amazing journey that we've had with neutrinos over the past hundred years uh, or so. What are you most excited about in the next five years? What do you think the next big result will be? Um, Anna, what would you say? Oh my God, this is, such a, <laughs> this is such a loaded question. I think everybody is, is pretty much expecting to find out what the neutrino mass hierarchy is. So which of the neutrino masses is the heaviest? So this is something that in the next five years, we might actually get there with the current experiments before Dune and Hyper-K are built. Um, yeah, I have my doubts whether we'll be able to figure out anything other than that. You know, maybe some other thing like neutrino mass from you know tritium decay or something like that but yeah fab thank you anna um uh, ivana would you be able to stop sharing your screen uh, as well uh costas remember one sentence or less uh yeah short baseline program at the uh, third lab and there is another anomaly i didn't talk about this involves the potential existence of star neutrinos i hope the spn program will put that to the rest Another one, when well, there enough. Thank you very much, Costas. And Ivana, what is your, what are you most looking forward to in the next five years? So in the next, uh, I'm mostly looking from the, uh, from the detection uh, side and I'm looking for a breakthrough. So uh, Dune will consist of four modules and only one uh, is going to be built at we are preparing the first one. So for the other three, there is a room open for new techniques that will be uh, will give us much more sensitivity. So 
breakthroughs in research and development uh, in detection techniques. Wow. Well, um, it's clear it's going to be a very exciting time. And a lot of that is going to be happening at SURF. So I'm sure that Connie is just as excited as we are. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. I have really enjoyed hearing about neutrinos over the last 100 years. And I hope we have piqued your interest and you have lots of questions to ask all of the people that you'll be seeing over the next uh, day and a half. So thank you so much for inviting us, Connie. And back to you. Thank you so much, Sophie, and thank you to the panelists. We're so grateful for those uh, amazing lessons uh, in neutrino um, history. And uh, we certainly are looking forward to having Dune here and learning more about uh, neutrinos and uh, oscillation and supernova neutrinos and all that. Um, so one last thing before we sign off right now, I want to invite you to come back at 3 p.m. Mountain, Mountain Daylight Time uh, to hear Mike Lammers from the Journey Museum talk about Lakota star knowledge. And uh, just a little surprise for you, our own Aaron Broberg is going to be joining Mike to ask him some additional questions so we can get some real insight into Lakota star knowledge. So thank you all. And again, thank you to uh, Sophie and our panelists. We're so grateful that you joined us this year. And uh, we'll see you all in about an hour.